All right. Now, one other little thing before I start. I'm really excited to say that we have a special guest in the room right now. In the back corner there is my mom, Debbie. So she's visiting uh, from Los Angeles this weekend, and she's heading to the airport just after class today. So it's rare that she's here during the week and gets a chance to see me teach. I think this is only the second time in, I want to say, in all the years I've been here. UCLA beat us, Mom. My mom is a two-time UCLA alum, so... Yeah, yeah. Right. So the back of her car has like, would have like a UA mom sticker and then also a UCLA alum sticker. So, but, uh, but she, she, I don't think, Mom, you care about college basketball. You'd root for UA, so... It's funny, actually, my, I have a 13-year-old brother. My dad's like uh, remarried, and I have a half-brother. His name's Wasam, and he's 13 years old. And he plays a lot of online video games. Um, have I told you all this story? It's super cute. So he came and visited last Thanksgiving and I took him to the UA ASU football game at the stadium, right? So he got to see me like yelling at other people and seeing all the cursing back and forth. And he's like bright eyed at 12 years old, like this is crazy, right? So now he plays video games online and when he's in these like online video game chat rooms, he tells the people he's playing with that he's a UA student living in the dormitories, right? So he's like 13 years old. He has a voice that's still pretty high pitched, you know what I mean? And he's like, yeah, I live in the, you know, the dormitories at the U of A and it's, I think it, I don't know, it's so super cute and, and, uh, and stuff. And I think he'll, maybe down the line he'll apply here. He's going to be starting high school next year. So that's really cute. Anyway, so I digress. But, um, so this we're going to be talking about today about counterculture sexuality in camp. So just to kind of situate us in terms of where we're at in the course. Unit one was all about representation and pop culture. Right? So it's all about outlining the ways in which different groups of women and different groups of marginalized people, be they sexual minorities, racial minorities, etc., are represented and in particular misrepresented in popular culture. Right? So in other words, the first unit was about kind of exploring these relationships between culture and power, culture and oppression. So we've established really clearly what popular culture looks like for women in the United States and the various ways in which it's oppressive and repressive. So the second unit now is meant to explore the other side of things. What are people doing to push back against cultural practices that maintain systems of oppression, right? And as we already talked about and we've already defined this term, that's what counterculture is all about, right? So back from unit one, we explored this definition that counterculture refers to the ways in which the creation, right, of or participation within culture can run counter to relations of inequality, right? And when you all look at this term, relations of inequality, your mind should immediately think, okay, well, this is about systemic oppression, right? So countercultures, like the punk scene in music or the queer anarchist scene in politics, challenge power relations, challenge systemic oppression, right? Challenge and push against inequality. Mm -hmm. And that's what this section is going to focus on, right? Is the various ways in which groups of marginalized people engage in cultural production or alternatively engage in representational politics, right? Another term that we're fam familiar with that challenge hegemonic relations of inequality, right? So in this unit, for the next few weeks, we're going to approach this from a number of viewpoints. One of the viewpoints is going to be a scholarly one. So what have women of color, trans women, low-income women, immigrant women, and other marginalized groups of women, right, uh, scholars had to write about culture. Then we're also going to look from an activist perspective, right? So how do activists, feminist activists on the ground engaged in, you know, real gra grassroots activism engage in particular representational strategies, representational politics, to challenge power relations, to challenge how we understand gender. And then finally, we're going to look at it from an artistic perspective, right? How do artists, how do female artists approach cultural production with, this is supposed to be not and, but with an eye towards the question of gender and power, right? And we should bear in mind that none of these approaches is entirely distinct, right? It's not like there's an activist world which is completely distinct from a scholarly world and completely distinct from an artistic world. And it's important to remember, too, in that sense, that culture, right, even things like the production of art are not meaningless, but they're very much political and can even be activists. So the lines between these things are blurred, right? But they still help us as categories to go through different approaches, right, different ways that people engage in cultural production and consumption, right? 
So this is important because a lot of people tend to think of countercultural production and consumption as largely performative, right? Involving performance. It's easy to think of culture as distinct from or unimportant to the political world, right? You oftentimes hear people say these tri trifectas, right? Like social, economic, and political, or political, economic, and cultural, as though these are referring to really, really distinct sorts of things. But again, the lines are blurred. However, a lot of people like to think of culture as distinct from or unimportant to politics, right? That culture is just performative rather than productive, right? That it's simply a performance, but doesn't really change things in the material world. And I'll admit, I'll be happy to be the first person to admit, I have fallen myself time and time again to victim, to, to being a victim of this sort of thinking, right? Like I had a large period when I was an undergraduate where I really was just like sick and tired of people who, who would, you know, go to, uh, to play music to draw attention to political issues, right? I remember thinking to myself, like, why the hell are you playing music to draw attention to political issues, right? Why don't you just get out and be an activist? Why don't you become active, right? So I was victim to this thinking that activism and cultural production or activism and art, we might say, are these really distinct things, but they're not, right? And the easiest way for us to think about why they're not distinct is just to look back on concepts that we've already covered. Concepts like representation, knowledge, power, misrepresentation, or the gaze. These are all concepts, a few of many that we already have, that help us link things like art, right, or culture to power by using concepts of re like representation, using concepts like the knowledge power nexus to show that art is not innocent, that cultural production is not innocent or free of political leanings, right? So these concepts, which we've used so far to study how mainstream popular culture can be oppressive, these concepts are equally important for studying counterculture, right? And these are some of the questions that you as students might begin to ask yourselves as you approach the different cultural artifacts that you're going to in this unit, right? And in particular, in your final papers, if you're trying to do an, an analysis of the countercultural potential of, um, you know, whatever it might be, it might be a set of music videos, it might be, you know, any number of things. So if we think about representation, right, we could ask ourselves, how do marginalized groups represent themselves, right? Or how are they represented by others in ways that challenge the relations of their own oppression, right? So we might think about things like self-representation as an important political tool to allow marginalized communities to represent themselves in media rather than being represented by other people, right? We might then turn to the concept of knowledge power and ask, well, what sorts of knowledge do these countercultural actions or artifacts create, right? Um, and what actions does that knowledge normatively encourage, right? Remember last week to this idea of normativity, right? So if you watch, for example, a who's, who, who's a good, like, kind of cool, edgy, somewhat countercultural music artist right now? Just that maybe some of y'all are listening to. Mm -hmm. Brock Ian, what? Brockhampton. Brockhampton? Okay. So, uh, how are they countercultural? Like, uh, they're really, really vocal about their opinions. Like, they have songs specifically talking about how um, being homosexual uh, is like a drug addict, and also they're not like directly related, are uh, treated more as an issue rather than um, something that should be like accepted. Uh, not so much homosexualism, but like drug addiction like, helps. So, they're, they're really trying to advocate more like aid and acceptance. Right. So, so the, I, I, that's really interesting, and I, I'm super interested to look up this. They're, they're a, a singer, or what kind of music? It's like a rapper. A rapper? Okay. Yeah, maybe when we take a little break during the day today, I'll pull it up and, and check it out, and maybe we can watch it as a class. So would you say that in the music videos or in the songs from Brockhampton, that uh, they imply a different way of knowing about, let's say, drug addiction? Um, kind of. They're saying we they shouldn't think of drug addiction as this like personal problem that needs to be cured or fixed, but just that drugs just are, like they just yeah. exist, and, they, they exist yeah. and they always will, and they're just there, you know, and that's that, right? So that different way of knowing about drugs then has different normative 
uh, implications, right? So in other words, if you listen to that song, you start to think this is the way I should respond to addiction, right? Or this is the way I should respond differently to someone who's gay, right? Okay. So again, we see that sort of thing, and we can look at that to analyze countercultural, right? The same thing with misrepresentation, and part of this unit is going to talk, or this lecture today, is going to talk about this idea of strategic misrepresentation, which we've addressed before, right? And then with the gays, how are we told to see different marginalized group, groups through their own representational strategies? So again, right, don't think of this unit as being conceptually distinct from previous units. But make sure you're taking those concepts and running them through, uh, you know, your reading reflections for this unit and what have you. So in order to kind of begin this sort of countercultural analysis, we're going to be looking at the cultural form or cultural practice of camp. So who's heard this term camp before today? Yeah? Three people, four people? Okay, so like before today, okay, and honesty, honest moment right now, of the four of you, have any of you not done the reading on camp yet? Yeah? Okay, so perfect. What, what, what comes to mind when you think of camp then? Because you don't have the reading that's already put all these like really, really specific definitions in your head. When you think of camp kind of culture, what do you, what do you typically think of? Almost like a clicky Clicky? I, I don't know how to describe it, but like okay. a specific group that had a very specific... Specific vibe? Like a, a, a thing going, right? Okay, that's, I think that's a good way to start, right? Because camp is its own world and certainly has its own sort of language and, and, and clickishness, right? Like there's an insider and outsider kind of position that you can be in relative to camp culture. I yeah. was just going to say, I'm a film and television. Okay. Player, so before reading this, I used to like a kind of parody, but... But it is kind of about yeah. parody. It's yeah. about parodying gender and sexuality in certain ways, yeah. Okay, perfect, perfect, right? So we're going to come back around to a really cohesive definition, right? And, and it's not easy to. Camp is kind of like always exceeds, right, whatever definition you could place on it. And there's certainly no cohesive history to it, though historians have kind of traced camp practices back to gay subcultures as early as the mid-1900s, right? Um, and it's been a really, really key site in scholarship in relationship to counterculture for queer communities in the United States, right? So in particular, camp has been understood as a way to communicate within the LGBT community, right? And a form of communication that spans decades, right? And when I say communication, I don't mean like a secret language that you can have a regular conversation in, but a way to communicate bigger ideas about the gay community, about the lesbian community, right? And about society in general, right? So oftentimes, camp operates through what we would call deferral rather than declaration, right? So in other words, in a society that makes sexuality so explicit and so constantly available, and in particular in a society that pressures people to be out and open about their sexuality, camp developed as a way of communicating within the gay and lesbian communities about identity at a time when it wasn't safe to be out, right? So we're thinking of a time period when it was hard to find any sort of social space in which you could go to and find other gay men, right, other lesbian women at, right? You needed to find ways to create those spaces or communicate about them without being explicit and easily found out, right? So, for example, one of the early kind of campy communicative practices was in the use of the phrase, a friend of Dorothy. Has anyone heard this term before? Can anybody guess what it means? Okay, so it is a reference to the Wizard of Oz, yeah, right? How do you think this, this term might have been used, right? So if I were to have said about somebody, you know, that they're a friend of Dorothy, if you were to kind of venture a guess, given that I'm talking about this in the context of camp and communication, what might friend of Dorothy be, have been used to communicate? Yeah? Exactly, right? So, so for example, if a man was talking 
right, with another male friend of his. And they both knew, right, they were both gay men, right? And again, imagine this is a time period when there was no such thing as being out, right? There was no such thing as just being out, right? So two gay men who know, however, that they're gay, right? Um, maybe one of them is talking to him about a friend of theirs, right? You know, oh, my friend Travis, like, you need to meet him. I think you two would really get along. He's also into football, right? The other friend could be like, oh, is he a friend of Dorothy's? Right? And, and, and John could be like, yeah, he is a friend of Dorothy's, actually, right? And then people who were listening to that conversation, right, outsiders, would think, what? There's some lady named Dorothy who knows a lot of people, right? And she's a mutual friend, right? But what was it really code for? Well, the phrase was code for essentially kind of asking, well, do they like the Wizard of Oz, right? This was a way of essentially coding into membership in the gay community, right, or gay identity because of this sort of classic association, which we could identify as being stereotypical, right, of gay men with art, with performance, with acting, with musicals, right, and an appreciation of those various art forms, right? So again, this would be an example, like a really sort of simplistic example of how camp as a culture functioned to communicate things, right? Now, what's misleading about this is that this is really subtle, right? right? This is meant to kind of pass subtly under everybody's sort of radar, but a lot of camp is really not meant to be subtle in any way, but is really meant to be in your face, right? So in the article for this week, Camping with the Stars uh, by Katrin Horn, um, we see a lot of insight and analysis into camp as a cultural practice, right? So we see this, uh, this quote, right, uh, that as most scholars who have worked on camp have noted, camp is, quote, hard to define and notoriously evasive. Part of this evasiveness can be explained by the fact that camp is at the same time firmly rooted in its historically specific origins in the gay subculture as it is fully dependent on its contemporary context of, at least in this case, popular culture, right? So in other words, right, what Horn is trying to kind of, kind of extract here, trying to, trying to convey, is that gay camp culture has a very specific history from which it is inextricable. However, its modern day reception is entirely tied to popular culture, current events, and what have you, right? We can think of this, for example, in terms of like hip hop music, right? Like I do research on hip hop in Palestine, right? And for everybody who does work on hip hop in Palestine, they know, right, if they're artists, if they're consumers, they know this sort of history to hip hop, right? Its origins in urban Latino and black communities in the United States in the 1970s, right? They know this sort of history to some degree, and it's important to them, that history, because that lends hip hop a sort of air of countercultural authenticity for Arabs who produce it, right? However, if they were to simply reproduce American hip hop lines and beats and rhythms and stuff, it wouldn't have any staying power as a countercultural artifact in a Palestinian context, right? So again, context is really important to camp being taken as camp, right? And to having that sort of countercultural edge, right? So Horn continues, and Horn right now is drawing from, from Medhurst, a scholar of camp culture. Horn continues, especially among drag queens, Medhurst stresses camp served to, quote, undermine the heterosexual normativity, right, which you all can know exactly what that term means now, through enacting outrageous inversions of aesthetic and gender codes. Horn continues, defined by wit, by an awareness of the performativity of the everyday life, or the natural, and by an estimation of the aesthetically, right, aesthetically we're thinking visual, aesthetically appealing over the morally right, camp offered a mode for rejecting middle class values. So someone can, can someone just tell us really quickly, just summarize that in, in like a one sentence form? I'm kidding. Um, but let's pick it apart, right? Let's work through this. So we've figured out this first paragraph, but this second one is really where, where the definition of camp is kind of hiding for us, at least as I've experienced it and understood it, right? So let's begin with this first line, that camp served to undermine the hetero nor heterosexual normativity through enacting outrageous inversions of aesthetic and gender codes. So what does that mean? Well, what do folks think it means? Who here has been to a drag show, watched RuPaul's Drag Race, right? Drag is, is an example, right, of a camp practice. So if you were to think about drag, 
right, in relationship to this line. Because if you'll notice, Medhurst's and Horn's analysis here is really about drag kings and drag queens, right? What would you think? Yeah? Um, I mean, it uses the word undermine, so kind of making fun. So, like, drag queens are, like, an extreme example of femininity. So, like, I mean, like, maybe just, like, poking fun at heterosexual normativity, but, like, through, like, visual art, kind of. Okay. So, who, who here has ever done this thing where they write this as with a D instead of an E? Like, undermined instead of undermined? Am I the only one who did, who's done that, like, over and over again? No? Yes? All right. Well, it's important to think about that difference, right, when you're thinking about this term undermine, right? Literally, to mine under something. So when we're thinking about this in relationship to gender and sexuality, right, Medhurst and Horn here are talking about literally getting rid of the very foundation, right, upon which our knowledge or assumptions about gender and sexuality are built, right? So continuing on this outrageous inversion of, of aesthetic and gender codes, what do we think about when we think about that in terms of a drag queen, for example? Yeah? Um, in the way that like, females are expected to be extremely feminine, but I feel like it's, in that way it's normative for women to like, apply makeup only. Mm -hmm. um, and so with drag queens, when they are like, you know, like I consider them masters of makeup, mm -hmm. Right, so you're actually both being very specific and getting ahead of me, and everything you said is perfect, right? If I were to take even one step back from that and, and kind of summarize that in a very sort of general way, right, we have all these ideas, these normative ideas about femininity and masculinity being these binary, diametrically opposed sort of things, right? So we have this idea of, of ideal femininity, right? Ideal femininity, which is defined you know, aesthetically by makeup, by particular dress styles, physically by a particular body style, right, with, you know, a big butt and big boobs and a skinny waist, this sort of Disney princess Barbie doll sort of image, right? And camp culture, or if we're thinking very specifically here, right, drag queens take this idea of ideal femininity and they, like, run with it, right? They take it straight to the bank. They say, okay, well, you, you're as a society suggesting that femininity is about makeup and about, you know, dress and about how our bodies look. And we're going to take all those sorts of standards and just run with them to exaggerate them to such a degree, right, that you as a society who are looking back in on this might begin to understand that what you think is so natural and normal and ideal, right, is actually this sort of caricature, right? It's just an idea with no real people there to, to materialize it, right? Almost such that no one can even achieve this perfect ideal femininity, right? These standards are set up to be unreachable in a certain way, and drag queens, among other camp performers, are taking those standards and literally trying to be like, what if I tried to turn myself into a Barbie doll? In a way, right? I mean, this is maybe a very sort of kind of a reductive way of thinking of it. Right? So let's continue through this. Defined by wit, by an awareness of the performativity of the everyday life or the natural. Right? This line has so much in it that we can think about in relationship to what we've already learned in this class. Right? So what they're essentially saying is that drag queens and camp performers, people who produce and consume camp culture, are really in a way unveiling the very social constructedness of what we take for granted as being natural, right? Such as our gender identities, right? So to continue the sort of outlining of this definition, right? Camp has emerged as a, per how would I pronounce this? Parodic, per parodic, I guess, parody, parodic, right? Yeah, mom? Yeah, parodic, okay, cool. A parodic device defined by the four basic features of irony, aestheticism, theatricality, and, hu and humor, and capable of questioning a given pretext's status as original or natural, right? So in other words, when you perform a drag performance, right, 
you are starting from the very position of being like, this is a performance, right? And then that performance is contrasted with something that's natural, right? Like anybody's normal day-to-day -day gender, right? But we already know our day-to-day -day genders are in and, them, in and of themselves performances, right? So this inversion that takes place happens when we begin from the point of assuming everything is performance, that our gender, our race, right, our identities are performed, right? And by accepting that from the jump as truth, then it inverts things so that the performer, the drag queen, is the original and the natural. And then everybody else who's just out there in the world doing their gender every day is actually the performer who doesn't even know that they're performing every single day, right? I know this is kind of dense, right? But I think it's really, really genius to think of, to think of camp in this sort of way, right? And again, camp ca cannot be extracted from its context, right? You know, it's originally based in the political, social, and cultural experiences of LGBT people, who's, which is really important for Horn, who writes against Susan Sontag, who's a really famous theorist in her field, against Susan Sontag's discussion of camp in her 94, or 1964 essay, Notes on Camp, right? So to help contextualize the history of camp, right, in 1964, there were already academic articles that had been published on it, right? So you're going to want to pay attention to that criticism of Sontag's work when you encounter it in the reading, right? So um, camp has been discussed and described as often, though not always, involving explicit, ex excessive displays or performances that, again, denaturalize the stability of categories like straight or male. Right. Um, but overall, it's important that we consider camp as a practice or a culture with really sort of unclear shifting boundaries, right? It's not so important to be able to say that is or is not camp as opposed to being able to discuss why it might be or might not be qualified as camp, what sort of countercultural um, potential it has, right? So, um, in, in, for this particular reading, right, and this is kind of going to be about the end of, of my discussion of the reading for this week, you're going to want to pay attention to the way in which Horn approaches Lady Gaga, approaches so how society has discussed Lady Gaga's gender and sexual identity, it discussed the sort of excessive aesthetic displays that Gaga engages in, and in particular, you're going to want to pay attention to how Horn uh, discusses sort of the limits, right, of thinking about or characterizing Lady Gaga as a queer camp icon, considering that she does not identify necessarily as a, as a camp performer. So, important to understanding camp, its production and reception, is the concept of strategic misrepresentation. So if we consider from the beginning that performances are themselves dynamic representations, right? So think here about how we subconsciously perform our own gender every day in the exact same repetitious sort of way that makes it appear as natural, right? So if we assume that all of our, all of our gender identity, all of our sexual identity is always a performance, then what that means is that camp becomes an intentional misrepresentation because of the fact that it's beginning from the point of view of saying this is a performance. There is no natural gender essence or sexual essence that we have as people. There's just performance, right? So what that means is that camp doesn't seem, seek to make essential claims about who we, the participants, are, right? So camp doesn't look to say this is who we as a gay community are. This is who we as gay men are. This is who we as lesbians are, right? But rather to misrepresent, misrepresent themselves with a purpose, right? So camp serves a lot of functions. It serves the function of building community by providing people with cultural artifacts to, to gather around and to socialize with and through. It serves as a way of communicating, right, about community and about identity. Right? It serves as a way of denaturalizing normative identity categories. Right? So camp isn't about saying there's no such thing as gender. It's about saying gender is a performance. And then finally, it's about creating spaces for interaction, love, safety, acceptance, and instability. Okay? So when we're thinking of strategic misrepresentation, we might define it as the creation of intentional images, knowledges, or narratives that contribute to a larger political and cultural or social strategy, okay? So when we think of a strategy, um, 
right? When you think of a strategy, a strategy is a grand picture, right? A strategy is a big picture thing. So a strategy is essentially a compilation of tactics, right? And these come together to form a strategy for a better world, right? So when we think about strategic misrepresentation, we need to remember that for mo in most cases, misrepresentation is problematic. In most cases, misrepresentation generates bad knowledge about groups, right? So we might be inclined to say, well, misrepresentation is always bad. Well, no, misrepresentation can be really effective if it exists within a larger strategy, right? So if we remember back to earlier in the semester, we talked about this, the kind of just like you, just like us narrative around the same-sex marriage movement, right? Everybody remember this conversation that we had? This idea that a lot of the people advocating for same-sex marriage legalization promoted this narrative of like, we're just like you. We want the, the cookie cutter, two car garage, white picket fence, right? Nuclear Christian family sort of model, right? And therefore you shouldn't be threatened by us, right? Uh, and therefore you should legalize marriage. This was a strategic misrepresentation of the larger gay community, right? To portray it as something maybe different than it is in order to accomplish something, right? So the big strategy was getting same-sex marriage legalized, right? And one of the tactics that they used was this sort of strategic misrepresentation, right? So in other words, the ability of camp or other forms of strategic misrepresentation um, um, to, to be effective, to be countercultural, has to do with their ability to speak to a larger context, right? Which is to say that strategic misrepresentations do not have a guarantee of being positive or negative, right? Um, but oftentimes will kind of carry both, both of those effects with it, right? So if we think about the example of legalizing same-sex marriage, this came with an upside and a downside. On one hand, the upside was same-sex marriage was legalized. On the downside, what it did was help to kind of make concrete, make official this narrative around homonormativity, right? In other words, the creation of standards for how to be properly gay. So if you think back to all those photos I showed of Neil Patrick Harris, right, and his family, right, this is sort of that, that perfect image that encapsulates what this means, right? So this was effective in legalizing same-sex marriage, right, but it wasn't effective in promoting uh, support for, for example, single gay fathers, right, who didn't fall into this sort of normative narrative of this nuclear family with same-sex same parents in it, right? So, um, Okay, so to kind of help elaborate a bit more on this idea of strategic misrepresentation as having positive and negative effects, you can look towards the article and Horn kind of addresses this because Horn doesn't try and conclude that Lady Gaga is this kind of ideal countercultural icon who's really helped advancing gender and sexual politics, right? Instead for Horn, the makeup of the audience is really important to whether or not Gaga is going to have a countercultural effect, right? And in particular, Horn talks about this not this concept of reading, right? Which is different than just you know reading some stuff written on a page. For Horn, this concept of reading is about being able to understand the nuances, right, of queer camp culture. So has anybody ever heard the phrase "tongue in cheek"? It's I guess like an idiom, I suppose, right? A little expression. What does "tongue in cheek" mean? Right, kind of said in a way that's not serious, yeah. right? And that almost you kind of mean something different, right? So think of it as kind of being in a way like sarcasm, right? You know, if, if, if let's say James were to have worn a, what's a, what's a basketball team I don't like? I'm trying to think. Like if, if James were to have worn a Miami Heat hat, right? And he was like, oh, you know, Alex, what do you think of my hat? And I was like, oh, yeah, it's really great. I love the Heat, right? That could have been tongue in cheek, right? Now, James might have thought that I was totally serious and I actually loved the heat, right? I don't. And you would need to understand me and learn how to read what I'm saying, right, to understand that I'm actually joking and being a bit sarcastic. 
And that's what Horn identifies as being the potential downside of strategic misrepresentation and camp culture, right? In terms of its ability to reach the mainstream or reach more popular audiences is that it oftentimes depends on being read properly, right? And if you think, for example, about like, so who's been to a drag show before? Folks in here, a few people. Has anyone ever go, gone to Diva La Paz? Right, okay. So a lot of times, right, there will be some people in the audience who go there to see a drag show and do it because of the spectacle, right? And their main takeaway is like, this is a spectacle, right? This is a performance that has no political power, right? However, other people will go in there and understand, be able to appropriately read the performance, right, as being about gender and about sexuality and about challenging the ways that we think and know and normatively act around those subjects, right? So reading as a critical cultural practice can be likened to the forms of cultural co-optation seen in both dominant and subversive cultures, right? So in other words, that in order to participate, right, in a particular subculture in an effective way, you need to be able to speak the language of that culture and understand it, right? So, I mean, for example, right, right, so for example, if we were to watch this video, which I love, Right. So when you watch this video, it's kind of funny, right? I mean, we all think this is kind of funny, right? Now, and it, which is kind of sad because this woman, I think, is really honestly trying to develop something really, really important here in this hip hop country dance sort of movement, right? Fingers crossed it hasn't caught on yet, right? But maybe it will, right? Now, this is funny to us, right, to most people, because not because of the fact that we don't believe she's trying in earnest, right, but because we read her as an outsider to a cultural form that we identify as being countercultural, right? No different than if we were to see, like, you know, a, a person who is in no way involved in the queer community trying to give a tutorial video on what drag is and why it's important, right? Because what this woman did is she took, right, kind of the political edge of hip hop and extracted from it these sort of narrow representations of what it involves, right? That like being able to dance hip hop is simply a set of moves that if you put them together and do them, that qualifies as hip hop when really being a hip hop dancer is about more than just that, it's about involvement in a community and in a culture, right, and the ability to read some of the things that come out of that culture. Now, um, okay, so, yeah, we're good on time. All right, so camp is one cultural practice of many, right, one strategy that's used by queer communities um, to both foster community and to gauge in politically effective representational politics. So to reiterate, right, what I tried to, to clarify at the beginning of this lecture, that if we're thinking about counterculture, right, we can rely on all these sorts of terms, of terms like performance and misrepresentation and knowledge, power, and normativity to be able to analyze those. In other words, CHAMP camp is all about challenging what and how we know about gender and sexuality and the actions that knowledge encourages. So, this is particularly important given everything that we just learned in the past couple weeks about biological determinism and the sex, gender, sexuality binary. This idea that there is this biological binary sex, right, that is biologically determined, that through that biological determination creates this natural and distinct 
masculine and feminine gender identities, right? And then, as we learned from that doing gen gender determining gender article by Westbrook and Schilt, that then ends up being connected to sexuality, right? So we have this sex, gender, sexuality, binary system, right? Such that if you are born male, it is expected you then perform a masculine gender and are attracted to women. Right, and this is that sort of binary. So we get left with male, female, masculine, feminine, and straight and gay, right? So in this formulation, right, that we've already been taught, gender or sexuality, right, is often seen as being about the gender of object choice expressed through our sexual identities as gay, straight, etc. Right? So for example, you all already know I identify as male, right? Good check in. Y'all are awake to hear, right? So if I were to tell you that I'm straight, what would that tell you about me? Yes. I was like, I was like, straight. Yes, exactly. That I like women, right? So what does that tell you about me? Really? Very much, right? It tells you about one particular aspect of the people that I'm interested in, right? Now, if I were to say I'm gay, right, what does that tell you? Right? So really, actually, it tells you a lot more about the people that I'm into than it tells you about me, right? And that's because sexual identity and sexuality are not the same thing. So I'm going to say this again. Sexual identity and sexuality are not the same thing. And you're going to want to remember that because there's a high likelihood it's going to show up on one of the questions on the midterm, right? So. The labels like gay, straight, and bisexual tell the listener the gender of the person that you like to be romantic with. When I say I'm gay, when I say I'm straight, if I say I'm bisexual, right, this tells the listener I like to be with people that have these sorts of body parts, right? Now you can begin to kind of understand immediately how this sort of system relates back to this biological determinism and binary, right? Because if we're starting from a point where we assume there's two and only two biologically determined gender categories, then it makes sense that we could have our sexuality be built around those identities, right? Now, let's think about social construction and this kind of, this, this question of being alone in the world, right? If, what's your name here in the hat? Caitlin. Caitlin. If you, Caitlin, like, just were, showed up all of a sudden on a planet by yourself, right? Do you think you would continue to identify as, as, as straight or as lesbian or as whatever your sexual identity is? Why not? Right? Because there's no one else, you know what I mean, right? So, you know, I could identify as straight all day long in a world where I'm by myself. It doesn't really matter, right? And maybe, you know, if I grew, lived in a world with no other people, my sexual identity might change. I might feel like straight doesn't really capture it anymore, and instead I prefer to describe myself as like, I don't know, interested in making out with trees. I don't know, right? You know, you're, I'm imagining this like alone on an island by myself, right? So I'm just defaulting to the resources that might be available, right? So sexuality is different than sexual identity. Sexual identity is the way in which we label ourselves and communicate that identity to each other. It has a lot to do with subjectivity as well, right? So in our case, in our world right now, in Western culture in the United States, sexual identity is about the gender of object choice, right? That's how we define and communicate sexu our sexual identity, right? However, sexuality is bigger, it's broader, it refers to the broad range of practices, interests, desires, preferences, likes and dislikes that compromise a person's sexual life, right? So even though, you know, uh, last week we tried to kind of, as a class, figure out what's, what a definition of the act of sex was, right? And we realized, well, we can't really define sex, the act of sex, in a way that everybody agrees upon, right? Um, sexuality approaches sex from the perspective of, well, we don't know exactly what sex is, but everybody's allowed to decide for themselves what compromises their sexuality, right? So let's talk about what might be included in sexuality that's not communicated through sexual identity, right? So if I say... You got backup yeah, markers for it? Yeah, yeah, right on. Okay, perfect, perfect. I'm just going to take the black from you. I think that'll be the purple. That'll have the most contrast. Right? So, so 
In terms of sexuality, right, sexuality is this big thing. It includes a lot of stuff. We're going to fill these in. But we take it right, and reduce it to sexual identity as just right, the gender of object choice. Okay. So what else is included in sexuality? Right? So I'll, I'll start with one thing. Right? This is maybe it seems a bit trivial. But I might say lighting on, off, dim, right? How do you like the lighting when you're doing sexual stuff, right? This is a part of your sexuality. It totally is. If you're someone who feels really uncomfortable doing stuff with the lights on, if you're someone who feels like you really don't like doing stuff with the lights off and you want the lights on so you can see everything, if you want something, if you're someone who likes the lights to be dim, you know, with some candles and a little Kenny G in the background, nice glass of bubbly, right? That's okay. Everybody's a bit different, right? But what's curious, I find, is that when you go to a bar, right, to try and meet your potential future ex-husband, right, you know, um, <laughs> You don't go and sit next to somebody, right? And you're like, hey, what's going on? Are you a lights on person, right? <laughs> oh, you are, wonderful, me too. I'm also a lights on person. Let's, let's get this happening. Let's, let's get something going here, right? No, you don't, right? Because our sexuality is really big and really broad and really complex, right? And that would be the most annoying ass conversation to have at a bar, like to run through some sort of a laundry list, right? All right, Jane, you and I are gonna talk. If you hit 25 out of 30 of the points on my list, we're gonna be good and we're compatible. Lights on? No? All right, bad start. So, what are some other aspects of our sexuality besides lighting, right? What else? Yeah. I don't know, like top, bottom, verse? Right, okay, so top, bottom, and verse, right? And what's verse mean so everybody knows? I switch, like, I, I versatile, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, right? So, Okay, yeah. What are some other things? Yeah. Location. So like her house, their house, somewhere else. Right, the back of the boat on its small <laughs> world. Like who knows, right? You know, exactly, right? So wait, did you say your house, their house, somewhere else? So those are the three big categories, like I mean yeah. Um all right, what else? Location? What else is on there? This isn't that hard. Come on, this is easy. I like to think this is a bit more fun than maybe like a biology. I'm so sorry that I said that. I know biology is really, really fun, right? Right. What else? What else is part of our sexuality? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So maybe bigger. We might say um, we might say contraceptives and no contraceptives. Or if you're thinking about this more from like a health perspective, we might say um, safe sex measures or no safe sex measures. Like you would also maybe want to use a dental dam for going down on a woman if you were looking to avoid, you know, transmission of any STIs or STDs. What other stuff? What other? What else is part of this? Yeah, it's like pulling teeth with y'all. Yeah. Like a sound. Like you like want music or no or. Right, background music. <laughs> right, you get in the bedroom, somebody's like, I only listen to Hungarian death metal during sex. <laughs> it's going to be interesting, right? Okay, background music, right? What else? Uh, loud or quiet. Okay, so we're going to say uh, vocal or not so vocal. <laughs> right. Yeah, you can't really like be like, I'd like it if you made less noise. <laughs> like that's kind of creepy. Like, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. My door mates asleep next to us, right? Yeah. Anyway, what else? Other folks, I saw a hand over here. Come on, I want to fill this list up. We got four more of these to go. This isn't too difficult. Yeah. I said like BDSM or like vanilla. Okay, BDSM or vanilla. <laughs> Vanilla, I know it's a weird term, just think like vanilla wafers, you know, it's like the default cookie, you know. It's like, no one's too excited about it, but 
We eat them. <laughs> All right, what else? Yeah. Yeah, that was one I was hoping someone's going to say, because I feel like that's really, really important, right? Foreplay slash no foreplay. Right? Two more. Yeah. Uh, other aspects are like things you want to do, so like making out beforehand or like cleaning up. Like I know that falls in foreplay, but like you do like. I mean, we can say after play <laughs> as well. <laughs> Good too. Right. Okay, give me one more. Cuddling, no cuddling, right? <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone ever heard this stereotype of guy about guys who don't want to cuddle but then want to cuddle after sex? Has anyone heard that stereotype? Yeah, I I I I've encountered it a few times. I don't know if that was one that is like dated and nobody's heard about before or not. All right, so. I want folks to break into groups of five to six, okay, just with folks sitting around you. Turn your chairs towards each other, and I'm going to give you all a few prompts for some questions I want you to answer. <laughs> just, just move your chair, make shuffling noises, you know, tr trick me into thinking that's what's taking place, okay. All right. So, what, one group here, seven of you? Six of you, so two groups. What about back here? Okay, three. Where are we at? Four? Is this another group? And then how about this group in here? Five and six? Okay, cool. So I'm going to expect six answers to these questions. So the first thing I want everybody to do as a group is to create a new system of sexual identification, right? We live in a world where we still have these complex sexualities, right? However, we have a new system of sexual identification, right? It's no longer the gender of object choice, it's something else, right? So when you're at the bar and you're talking to somebody and you think you might be interested in them but you're not sure about their sexual identity, you might be like, listen, I know this might be a bit premature but uh, are you a lights on person, right? You know. Um, so what is your new system of sexual identification, right? And, and what positions exist within that system? So first I want you to come up with that answer, right? And then the next thing I want you to do as a group is to think of how that plays out. What does that look like? In other words, I want you to take this bar scenario, right? I want you to take this bar scenario and I want you to run with it. So I want you to picture that, you know, you're showing up at a bar, you start talking with somebody at the bar and things are going pretty well. You want to get that big question out of the way, right, about sexual identification. So what do you say to them, right? And then, right, fast forward an hour, two weeks, a month, right, two years, who knows. You're in bed together, right, and you're fooling around, and then that awkward question comes up because something left on this list of sexuality, which wasn't conveyed in the sexual identity thing, ends up creating an issue, right? So we already, you know, you're at the bar, let's say, in today's current world, you know, I'm, let's say I'm straight, right, and I meet a woman, and we end up going back to my house and we start fooling around and I turn off the lights and she's like, whoa, like I'm a lights on person. We definitely should have gotten this out of the way earlier when we were at the bar. This isn't going to happen. Bye. Right. And I'm like, don't worry, I'll call you an Uber. <laughs> and the lights will be off in the car because legally when you drive at night, you're not allowed to turn on the light in the car. Did anybody's parents make you think that if you turned on the light in the car at night, like the world was going to end and it was illegal? My mom did that for me for sure and I know. That's not the case anymore. It's definitely not illegal, right? So all of a sudden, because we have this system of sexual identification that reduces sexuality to this simple representation of this complex thing, all of a sudden you're in the bedroom and this little awkward sort of thing happens. So you need to figure that out and work that out, all right? So what happens there, right? So I want you all to answer those two questions, and I'm going to go through all the groups and have folks share back, okay? So take about five minutes to do that. It shouldn't take too long. And we're going to share back at like two or three minutes after. All right? Get to work.
So the second question was then, imagine what, how that plays out, right? So how does that play out socially, you know? Um, like, you know, when you're at the bar now, if I was chatting with James and, and, and I was like, you know, this is going well, James, you want to grab a drink later? James might be like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm straight, right? So that's a little, a little situation in a bar, right, that works out because of the way in which sexual identity becomes immediately visible and available to us since we rely on gender as a way of approaching it, right? So if instead we were lights on and lights off, right, how would that play out at the bar maybe differently, right? We keep working. A couple more minutes. <laughs> All right. All right. So let's go ahead. Let's start. Let's start with this first question. So group up here. What's your What's your new sexual identity system? Okay, what about the group behind them? 
I'm so sorry, you seem like a really nice person, but uh, I'm just into assholes. Yeah. <laughs> Which being into assholes could be an entirely different system of sexual identification, right? All right, so number three, let's do this group. We're always back here at this. We said drink of choice. Drink of choice? So based off of your favorite cocktail. Or like what you see them doing at the bar. Okay. Okay. Um, what about this group up here? Um, body hair. Okay. So, so what are the identi identities within that system? Like shaving, waxing, not shaving, body hair. <laughs> All right. Middle group here. Yeah. Um, Bert? This is like, this is the way it should be. <laughs> Actually, it's funny, my mom used to be a cat person, but she came out really late in life as a dog person. It was, it was, a, hard, it was a hard conversation. <laughs> but I was already a dog person, so I was really accepting overall. All right, and then we have, are we, have, are we missing one group? Yeah. We need a Zodiac sign. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, so for the people who pick dog or cat, wait, where's that group? So, what are you, what are you born as in your system, and what do you have to come out as if you choose to? I mean, you're not born as anything; you choose yourself. Okay, so it's not like you live in a dog-centric world where it's like you put you put a shirt on your your like one-year-old baby boy that says, like, watch out, ladies, heartbreaker coming. And it's like, you're forcing your sexuality on your son. Like, you know, even though everybody's like, oh, it's, you know, the gay and lesbian community, they're forcing sexuality on their children. It's like, just look at those onesies that have, like, that stuff written on it. It's crazy. Anyway, all right. So in your system, there would be no default, right? There would be no, you know, gender reveal ceremonies. It would be like, we'll wait until this person decides if they're a dog or a cat or something and identifies that way. All right. What about like uh, the long term versus one night? Is there like a default sexuality in that one? What? Same, Same thing. You all are like, no, I hate the system of coming out in heterocentricity, so we're just going to answer the question the way you want it to be. OK, cool, right? So now what happens, right? Who's in the zodiac sign group, right? So I'm in Aries. We'll assume that you know, because of psychology, I'm attracted to similar people. I go and I meet an Aries at a bar, and we come back home. Right, and we start pulling around, and it turns out that I love Kenny G in the background, right? <laughs> and the other person doesn't like Kenny G in the background. How does that play out? Potentially, how might it play out? What? Probably turn off the Kenny G, right? <laughs> right. But what? But I mean, you're you're assuming then that the Kenny G thing isn't as important to my sexuality <laughs> as the gender of object choice is to, let's say, a straight man's sexuality, right? Because I don't think you'd make the same suggestion of a straight man, right, in a situation where they found out that the person that they were with was identified as a gender different than they were attracted mm -hmm. to, right? And this is actually a really important topic in, in the news today, right? So you might say I would turn off the background music, right? And I would agree to you, <coughs> agree with you, right? I'd probably turn off the background music, right? How else might that play out? Right? Okay, right. I could be like, no, I really need my Kenny G. And then the other person might be like, all right, like, we might both be Aries, but I, we don't see things the same, right? Exactly, right? But does this sound like it's the worst thing in the world? Finding yourself in the bedroom and finding out that you both don't like Kenny G. But unfortunately, it is important enough that that means you're not going to sleep together. But like, does it sound like just the very worst thing in the world to have happen? But it's interesting, then, that when we think about the system that we do have, right, this gender of object choice system, right, the things that people will justify based off of the assumption that the system is so natural, almost biologically determined, right? So you have so many instances, for example, where a person will go home from the bar with someone who identifies as transgender, right, not knowing their gender identity, simply assuming it, right, based off of the way they perceive the person aesthetically, right? And then in the bedroom, upon finding out about there being a difference over here, right, respond and react violently. 
have folks heard about stories like this? Right? And it's actually a big debate in the court system right now whether or not that is a legitimate defense right, for harming or even killing somebody. Right? But this is extremely problematic because it shows the degree to which right, this system of reducing the complexity of sexuality to just the gender of object choice as a stand-in for sexual identity ends up creating all these miscommunications and problems, right? And what do we find ourselves doing in those situations, in those awkward bedroom, bedroom situations, where there's, where maybe our sexualities don't line up in the way that we would hope, right? Because we believe in a system like this that as long as I'm a straight guy and I meet a straight woman, that because this lines up, this is going to line up, but it just doesn't work that way, right? In fact, also often it doesn't work that way. And when it doesn't, right, we don't know what to do, right? As a society, we really don't know how to handle these things in an effective way. And this is important to the study of gender because these things don't occur, these little problems don't occur, and they're not experienced in the same way by women as they are by men, right? This is one thing that's really critically important because we default to our normative scripts, right? Right? We default to the normative way we've been told to do something. And in our society, sex normatively involves the man making the decisions. What position are we changing into? How fast is it going to be? When is it over? Right? Think back to those x, y axis charts that we did last week over here. Right? So in these situations of miscommunication, it oftentimes ends up being that the woman gets harmed. Right? Did folks in here, show of hands, who read the article, the original article and ones that relate to it about the uh, date that a woman went on with Aziz Ansari and the way that played out, right? That is a perfect example of why this system that we have is so problematic. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have a system where gender is a part of our sexuality. There's nothing wrong with saying that you're attracted to men or saying that you're attracted to women. What becomes problematic is that then this is taken to imply all of this, right? But it's just assumed that the man is going to be the one who initiates contact, who pursues the woman, who goes on the hunt, who finally beds her, right? All this sort of language that we already have in our society is built off of the fact that we assume so much through this narrow sort of system. And I know it seems like exhausting, right? If you think back to the, the article on the five sexes revisited, right? This is how the author is talking about gender. She says, like, I know you all probably find it to be exhausting, the thought of living in a world where when you go to the bar and you meet somebody, you actually do run through this entire list of things, as opposed to just relying on the simplicity of this non-conversation, of being like, I'm straight, you're straight, perfect, let's do this thing, right? So it's really important then to think about the way in which we know, right, the way in which we generate knowledge about sexuality. Because right now, the only way we generate knowledge about sexuality and sexual identity is through the gender of object choice, leading to all these miscommunications, right, forcing us to default to our normative scripts, normative scripts which are already built off of patriarchal understandings of sex, gender, and actual acts of sex, right? And then oftentimes women end up getting harmed, right? Because what happened with Aziz Ansari, it's not necessarily a crime, right? And actually what's so scary and problematic about it is just how normal it is, how often that happens, right? And how as a society we oftentimes label that bad sex, right? Oh, you know, it was just a bad date with bad sex and it didn't go well, and, and that's awkward and unfortunate, right? But the reality is that's systemic, right? It's, it's already been built into the systems that exist in our world so that women have to routinely face having bad sex and bad nights like this because people don't communicate this to each other. Instead, we just do these scripts that we've already been taught. And to get you out of here, still two minutes early, hold on. The one thing that's really important about camp is the fact that it suggests that there's a different way of generating knowledge about sexuality and about gender that's different than this sort of binary and deterministic approach. So I will leave you all with that. I will send out an email in regards to the quiz that you need to do for attendance on Thursday. All right. Have a good one.